Hello and good morning. I'm Lisa Richardson. I'm, I'm actually here today in a bit of a two roles. Um, so I'm here as a build consultant. Some of you probably met me as you arrived and registered. Um, and so helping out with the conference today. And some of you may have also seen my name pop up because I'm involved in the Kent, Surrey and Sussex community of practice. Um, so I do a lot of work around kind of putting things on the blog if you receive that on your emails and on Twitter if you're uh, a, a Twitter. Uh. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm very much involved in that and I'm here today also to talk about the new closed Facebook group. So do come and have a chat to me. I'm just down the corridor um, over lunch. And then this sort of in the next sort of 30, 40 minutes, I'm here with a different hat on, which is my um, role at University College London. Um, as a researcher there, we've been doing um, some work over the last year, creating and um, helping people to deliver our Standing Up For Myself group programme. Um, so the Standing Up For Myself programme, hello, hello. come and take a seat. So I was just introducing myself, my name is Lisa, um, and uh, the Standing Up For Myself programme. So it's, we hope, going to be in the future, very welcome, um, a public health intervention. So what we mean by that is that it's a group that lots and lots of people with learning disabilities could benefit from. Okay, so it's not something that we want to just do with a small group and then it disappears. We've got a quite a long um, future vision for, for the project. And what we want to do, what we want to help people with learning disabilities to do in attending um, one of our groups is to help them develop the ability to stand up to the kind of negative attitudes they face because they are um, labelled in this uh, learning disability. Okay, so that's what we mean when we talk about managing and resisting the stigma. It's just standing up to negative attitudes and a negative way that some people perceive and treat people with a learning disability. That's what we mean. Um, I would just like to very quickly mention that this isn't just my work. This is led by Katrina Sior at UCL. It's her. Um, idea if you like and then there's been a, a very big team of us working to develop the program and evaluate it to see how well is this working is it making a difference to people who take part um, so we've got uh, people from other universities we've got people who are working as clinical psychologists um, and we also have a really strong team of uh, self-advocate advisors as well for this project. So people with a learning disability saying, yes, we like that idea, we think that could work, and no, don't do it that way, how about we try this? So they've been very much involved in each step of, of the project, guiding us along the way. So I just wanted to start with thinking about this idea of stigma and what do we mean by that? Why is it a, a, is it a problem? And we can have a, have a bit more of a, a group discussion or individual discussion on that in a moment. Um, so stigma really is this sort of process where other people's reaction to a label, in this case a label of learning disability, actually really spoils that person's identity. This is how Goffman describes it. What do we mean by that? It, it disrupts, it upsets the way people see themselves and they can start to believe those negative attitudes of other people. Um, obviously if we then go on to believe those negative things about ourselves because we've been given uh, a label, it can limit the things that we then go on to do or that we believe we can do and achieve in life. Um, I think that really sums that up. Is there any, any questions about that? Yeah, but uh, like with, with learning disabilities, we're all different than everybody else. We're not like everyone's got the same, we're all different. Completely right, completely right. So actually, yeah. just having a label of learning disability yeah. doesn't, ne doesn't tell me about you, Andrew. No. It doesn't tell me about Jenny, who's here today, no. and lots of other people besides. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And so yeah. if we just take that label and think we know 
what that means about you. Yeah. We're but missing. Actually, that actually you don't know. That means. We don't know. No, no. We're missing a lot of information yeah. about you, and we haven't got to know you, have we? Yeah. But if we just think, oh, learning disability, it means X, Y, and Z. It yeah. means you can't do things. Yeah, but it's like you can't do things and that. But it's the other thing about it is what information you can take back. Because it's like the, the new date protection law that's coming, you have to only take relevant information. Yes. And you can only ask, like, if I want to do it, find out my information, I have the right to find out mm-hmm. about it, but it can't be spread to anybody else. It's, it's, yeah, it's, a really, really good point. So we have to think about how we're careful about sharing people's yes. information. There's a bit of a danger there, maybe, yes, in that we just say, oh, here's, here's Andrew, he's got a learning disability, or here's mm-hmm. Jenny, or here's Frank. And yeah. that we, we're restricted by what else we share. And that how do we involve the person then in sharing information that's important about them? Yeah, because it recently started, I think it was this year, I think this year. Yeah. Uh, that that's all the stuff you want to match on. It is. It's been a lot of fun trying to implement that for a lot of people. Yes. And a lot of emails have been yeah, flying around on this. A lot of people were trying to, um, like when you go to Google, they were trying to get personal private information from yeah. that way other places, yeah, and yeah. so that's why they put the data de- de- protection law in to stop people from trying to get access to their uh, information. Absolutely right, absolutely right. Important, but comes with some other problems. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I really wanted to open up, um, as it's a workshop, some discussion um, at this stage. So I am going to tell you a little bit more about the STORM project and what we did and what that involved, but I just thought as the focus of Learning Disability Week, um, is around health inequalities um, as it's very much an interest I think of everyone who's come to attend the community of practice that we could have a think about what are the effects of stigma on people with learning disabilities so what is the effects of those negative attitudes and actions um, on people with learning disabilities how does that affect their health and how could that lead to health inequalities so I want to just, I know it's quite difficult just to speak to a room, so perhaps with the people next to you, if you want to just have a, a discussion about some of these uh, uh, questions that I've, I've left you with, and then maybe we can then feed back to the room once we've got a bit of that discussion going. Is that all right?
flying up now. So really like to hear your thoughts on this, what you've been, been talking about. I think the, fa- the main thing would be diagnostic overshadowing. Diagnostic overshadowing. Do you want to say what you mean by that? So people look at the learning disability as the main focused diagnosis rather than anything else which has a knock on effect on all the Yes. Yeah. Huge effect. Yeah. So you miss all kinds of other ordinary health issues and serious health issues. I want to talk about some more examples. Yeah. Um, okay. What were some of those examples? Up there's somebody who was um, deemed to have epilepsy, but because they had a learning disability, that was just deemed to be part of the package, and then had to not review, they're on the epilepsy medication for mm. life, mm. developed a toxicity to the epilepsy, and actually died from that. Mm. But, but nobody's picking that up, reviewing it, or because it's a, they've got a learning disability, so epilepsy is mm. kind of a yes. of assumption you have it. Yes, and that we don't then have to keep reviewing it and review it. And, you know, yeah, the other example was uh, somebody <coughs> had been uh, lived with a parent mm-hmm. and the mum had a massive heart attack, died, and never been in respite. So the sister who had a new baby came to look after her and the child's behaviour increased, had dangerous behaviour, I went and consulted the psychiatrist to ask them if they would review her in line with all the changes and was told she was too severely learning to say to have a mental health condition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, a, in a sense, that you you've got a learning disability and all of these other things that might come with that, but we're just going to focus on the learning disability yeah. and, and forget those other things. So that's definitely sort of where people get unequal treatment compared to other people who might only have epilepsy and they have that epilepsy well attended to, and then um, other people who. Um, have needs that aren't being addressed, that are being overlooked because it's assumed that actually not everybody has mental health. It seems to be what they're saying there. Um, it's, the same, or it's the same thing that learning disability is mental health. Yeah. Or the assumption that a learning disability is mental health. Yeah, so that overshadowing of the learning disability being this bigger thing that we need to focus on. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, some really good examples there. Thank you for sharing. Did you want to? Yeah, yeah, and uh, also, um, I wanted to do wrestling and things like that, or get into the ping pong, and there's always barriers there. Mm. Barriers saying, oh, you can't do this, you're diabetic, you can't do that. And it's not fair. People with disabilities need to have that choice, do what they want. Mm. And also, I um, got to do a lot of support uh, from South South, and if it wasn't for Jenny, if it wasn't for Jenny, right, she got me involved in to help in South South doing the support there yeah, to like me do training to support you support workers to train them and how I like to be supporting. Mm. Yeah, fabulous. So as it as it should be, yeah. So yeah. focusing on all of the things that are important about and for for yeah. you as a person. Yeah. 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 We were talking about other things. Andrew's yeah. has got lots of work opportunities but for some people mm. they may not have like those um, those doors may be closed to them. Uh, with employers as well, because we know that you know, people with learning disabilities mm. are less likely to, to be employed in that mm. mm. so. mm. Yeah, and have the support to, to get jobs and maintain jobs. Mm. And what an effect of that mm. you know, isolation, lack of friendships, or opportunities to make new friends and acquaintances and earn money. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, and then the knock-on effect of that on health, and it, the, the, this sort of a tide, isn't it, that keeps coming in with one thing that has a really negative consequence on something else um, that, that we're also overlooking at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, and the main thing about you about to talk about the Johnson thing, or is that what well, that's what's been happening around this country? That uh, people that want to go to to get jobs here, uh, people in the city are not getting accepted throughout our jobs. And I think we should get mm. accepted to work for written through the great jobs. Because like I've noticed some of my best friends who are earning to and they're like, oh, sorry, because you've got learning disabilities, you can't do it. That's not right. We should be entitled to do these jobs. Mm-hmm. Like right. everybody else does. Yeah. So is there some sort of belief floating around out there that people are still very much holding on to that is putting up these barriers as yeah. you said. Uh, to you kind of achieving all of the things in life that you want to do. Absolutely, absolutely. 
And we, if, talk, we talked about knock-on effects, so, so how might the effect of health? Um, and in terms of, well, if they start, as, as, as anybody does, not having mental health problems and not having physical health, stigma in itself could cause them to have those. So, you know, the fact that we perhaps treat people differently, we become isolated, then there's mental health issues because of being isolated, or that they won't ask, access services and support for health issues, again, because they don't want to be treated differently. Mm. So they might start absolutely fine and end up, as a result of the stigma, in a, in a worse situation. That's the kind of thing we were doing there. Well, I think we've got reverse as well, so mm-hmm. that if people are not aware that somebody's got the intellectual disability, they won't present the information the same in terms of informed consent and understanding that process of, for example, an MRI scan or something like that. Yeah. So I think you kind of get those health inequalities because of that lack of information. We were talking of, um, in an earlier session actually about um, the fact that NHS systems don't necessarily have that the person's got an intellectual disability flagged up so when that person goes mm. into acute care, mm. such as any need, then they're not instantly flagging the LD liaisonness sure. unless yeah. it's pointed out to that person. And that person might not even appreciate that there is an LD liaison nurse for that particular service. So mm. it's a little bit like, you know, trying to find a needle in the haystack to try and get yeah. them as best care. To get the right support and the right care in place. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I have got flagging systems, but I am saying that I wouldn't like if I was a patient to have a little symbol above my head mm. to say that I have a learning disability because mm. if I had acne or diabetes, I had not so wouldn't have that like pointing out. So those yeah. like it's that communication what we have. Yeah. I just I think it's wrong. Yeah. Did you want to say something on that, Matt? It's interesting those sort of themes. Uh, I was talking to someone who's a counsellor um, in two teams from people with learning disabilities and then another of children's services with parents of people with uh, learning disabilities mm. and how much disclosure there is if someone has learning disabilities mm. uh, and how much information is out there talk about information how much information is out there yeah. because if I go to counselling I would expect uh, confidentiality about mm. my bowel movements my sleep patterns my medication <laughs> my relationships mm. my this that yes. and that and yet, for lots of people going through those services, it's like a take a look at what you want. Yes. 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 Yeah. You can literally flick through the pages of people's yeah. daily life and, and intimate yeah. information, which can be taken for granted. Um, sometimes it's overlooked, sometimes it's taken for granted. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yes. Yeah, and also, uh, one other thing, I've worked, I've worked for a short and I worked for like, as a kitchen system. Yeah. The volunteer job. And um, one thing that really annoyed me, right, is um, I've done training for West Sussex online. And um, basically, um, I've said to my line manager about this, that I want to do COSH training. Mm. Mm. And pay, apparently, they're, West Sussex are not giving people out of these, right, that training, when I think it should be right. We should have this training. Mm. Because what could happen if someone like with learning to walk someone and start drinking bleach? Right? Yes. If I drink good bleach, then someone then we're starting to say, What's that happening? And they say, Well, do you need to do the training? So what's the point? Yeah. yeah. At the end of the day, we need this training. And, I, and that's what I'm trying to get sorted. So hopefully I can get the training. Good. Well yeah, that sounds like a good example of someone standing up for something that they need, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. and it's not just bad. With people learn disabilities, right, say so like they want to get a job or something, they think, oh yeah, he's got to learn this we just put them in this category, and they have to be in any other category. Yeah, and maybe not think about what you might want to do next after yeah. a while, that you don't want to just stay doing that same thing forever. Yeah. You might want to change and try something else out. As we all do in our jobs, we kind of change and, and mm. go into different roles, don't we? And want to progress and get new training and learn mm. about the things that you know we don't really know about. Yeah. So yeah, I think there's also a little bit about um, that this sort of stigma that those with learning disabilities can't be spoken to about yes. their own issues, their own health issues. Mm. That it's always their parents that's spoken to or their carer, mm. or actually sometimes parents and carers aren't around and they have different carers who might be taking Yeah. 
Yes, it's ending this awkwardness around having these conversations and how do I approach that, how do I start that. It's one of the things we did um, at the beginning of, of this project was actually to ask a lot of people who are running groups for people with learning disabilities or working in schools and teaching, you know, do you actually talk to people about having a learning disability? What, what do you think they said? <laughs> Pretty much. So it, it was never a conversation that was even in the room. Um, it might happen over the kettle if something's come up specifically for someone. Um, but on the whole, it kind of tends to get ignored. Like we don't, we don't want to kind of flash a light on this. We don't want to kind of make people overly aware of, of, of having a learning disability. At the moment, I'm trying to organise a disability fishing club to help disability people learn disabilities. Sounds fantastic. I'm sure and there'd be a lot of interest. People with learning disabilities say they've got more skills when they learn more things. Yeah, so it's not always about having a job, is it? It's not always about when we go to our doctor or our hospital. Sometimes we just want something to do with our time that we enjoy and that that's good for our health. But sometimes these things aren't offered to us, are they? It takes people like you, James, to set that up and get, get things going for people. So that's also brilliant. About the clubs that are out there already yeah. being more willing and more accepting of those. Mm. Right. Yeah. Right. So actually, it's about putting a little bit of training in there, a little bit of awareness. Actually, that mm. this little boy really wants to go to this sports club. He really wants for his own health. You know, but being told, oh no, you can't come because you can't do that. That's yes. going to, you know, it's going to give him a stigma. He thinks he can never go and do a sports club. He can never do these things. And actually, mm. oh, yeah, you can't do it. Yeah, and I think. It's the layers of that, isn't it? Okay, that might have been one isolated incident, but if you think about that, layering up and layering up, no, you can't, you're not welcome here, we can't support you, you can't do this. And it's not just a knock-on effect to him, it's a knock-on effect to family. It's like, yeah. and then if a parent gets told, a parent care gets told so many times, no, 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 they're going to think, oh, do you know what, I'm not going to try, why should I get an ejection every time? And therein we have this idea of stigma transferring into family carers and that they then have the negative effects on their mental health, their physical well-being and how is that being attended to. Yeah, I'm going to move this on now, I think we could probably talk about this for the whole of the session but as I said I'd come and tell you about Storm, I probably should, um, should do that. Um, so we'll just move past this. Really just to say that we think that these negative attitudes and things are things that need to be tackled at different levels. So we kind of talk about it at a structural level. So what do we mean by that? We mean laws, policy, government doing things to help reduce these negative attitudes and actions. Probably quite a difficult thing to do, but there are campaigns, you know, um, Mencap's got their, their campaign at the moment about health equalities that would kind of fit in here. And then we're kind of thinking about kind of family and interpersonal, so just you know the general public. How do we change attitudes and actions towards learning disabilities in that area? Most evidence says that we need more people having contact with people with learning disabilities, sharing time, sharing space and interacting takes a long time to change those attitudes. Meanwhile, what are people with a learning disability doing to manage and deal with these ongoing negative attitudes and actions they experience, whether it's hate crime, whether it's I go to the hospital and I don't get the treatment I need, or actually my mum and dad, they kind of stop me going out because they think I can't go out on my own. And this is really where we wanted Storm to come in, because there wasn't anything out there that we could find that was going on for people with a learning disability to think about how do they cope with this and how do they stand up to these attitudes. So that's where we're pitching it. But pitching it, I think, I'm just going to move through this one, we probably don't need to focus too much. Um, pitching it that, you know, we don't think it would be fair that if we only 
had people, you know, saying to people with learning disabilities, you've got to manage and cope and resist and stand up to this. Those other layers of things have to be happening too. So the time felt right that some of those other things were going on. There was lots of organisations trying to do good things in this area and that it felt like a good time to bring this in to help people themselves. Um, so the Standing Up For Myself programme... Um, drawing on different approaches so we're using some cognitive behaviour therapy so that's thinking about how do we think about problems and how do we solve problems um, we're using narrative approaches what do we mean by that we mean about people sharing stories telling stories experiences. and experiences but also focusing on positive and strengths and thinking about where do they want to go next so that you know a sense of story isn't isn't over, we're going somewhere, we've got a direction, yeah? And what do I want other people to know about me? Very much, Andrew, what you were talking about, sharing yeah. information. And we're also drawing on liberation psychology, it's quite a new um, area from South America. Um, really just, you know, saying that we need to acknowledge this stigma, this negative attitudes and actions before we can overcome it. So that's very much part of STORM is that we're getting people to kind of share those experiences, hear about other people's experiences and say, yeah, we don't accept this, it's not right. And then we make a plan and think about how to overcome this. So that, that's uh, another approach that we're drawing on. The groups themselves um, run for four weeks. They're 90 minute sessions. Um, and then there's a booster session at the end, and I'll tell you a bit more about that at the moment. in a moment. Um, this is just the front cover of our manual for, for the people who are running the group, and the, the design was done by uh, Lester McGugan, who's a gentleman and artist with a learning disability. Um, yeah, delivered by existing group facilitators. So this isn't us as researchers saying we've got this really good idea and we're going to run these groups and we've got these skills or clinical psychologists or speech and language therapists can do this. That would be really expensive and it wouldn't happen. It would drop off. So we want people who are running groups in schools and colleges, in social groups, in advocacy groups to kind of get involved and that's who we've been trying to invite to take part. They're provided with training to be able to deliver the programme and all the resources that they uh, might need to do that and support along the way as well. Um, and this really is our kind of reason for doing this. This is what we want people to go away thinking. That I matter, I matter equally. Not if only, not as long as, I matter equally, full stop. So if there's one thing we want people to take away, it's that belief in themselves that they matter and they have a right. We've broken that down a little bit for each of the sessions to think about how do we support people to stand up for themselves. So in session one, our kind of key idea is my learning disability is only one part of me. So people will share their experience around what does learning disability mean to them. That can be very personal, it can be things that they've heard other people talk about and we watch some videos about that, but then they also get to share their stories. This is what I'm proud of, this is what I'm doing, I've achieved and I've done and I'm interested in. These are all the things that make up who I am, this is me, yeah? So trying to end on a positive there as well, that all the, all the sessions end on a very positive note, trying to make them interactive and fun. Session two then, is this is the bit where we, well, I was just talking about that kind of idea of liberation and acknowledging the negative and the bad things that happen. And we want people to go away with a sense that it's not okay for me to be treated badly. And I don't have to put up with that. Um, so we look at the range of treatment that people with a learning disability might have. Sometimes that can be quite negative experiences and that can be quite difficult and potentially upsetting, potentially make people quite angry, rightly so. But also that we look at um, examples of when people with a learning disability have been treated as equals and fairly and, and all of those other things to show that, you know, it's, it's not all a bleak picture. Um, and session three is really when we start to get to grips with and thinking about 
standing up for myself and how might I do that when people treat me badly? How have other people done that? What worked, what didn't work? How can I do that safely? Yeah, because what we really don't want is that people, you know, are standing up for themselves in the community and making themselves more vulnerable. So we definitely want to be thinking about that with people in terms of how they might respond. And then that really builds up into the next session where we work with people, or the facilitators work with people rather, to help them make a plan around what they want to do to stand up for themselves. Sometimes that could be just be about, actually I just, need to, I, want, I just want to find a way to cope with this a bit better and look after myself a bit better when these things happen and sort of thinking about that, what the things that I'll do to look after myself. Other people are kind of thinking much uh, bigger. So some of the groups have kind of gone off and done, um, you know, formed their own groups that they want to keep meeting and combating hate crime and how are we going to do that? We're going to keep meeting and, and standing up to hate crime, making their videos, doing their own blogs and just kind of promoting this idea and, and getting kind of, yeah, trying to have more contact with other people who don't understand learning disabilities. So going into schools being involved with, with children and getting that education and at a young age. So it's very much up to the group to determine how they want to do that, whether it's something that's quite personal to them or something that's part of a kind of a bigger uh, sort of advocacy movement, if you like. And then we had this idea of the booster, which really was just to kind of bring people back together and give them an opportunity um, to look at their plans, what's going well, what's not gone so well, what should we change and do differently. So... Um, Apparently I'm being recommended some updates, so we'll just ignore that for a moment. Um, other things to say that I haven't already mentioned, um, that you know, it's very kind of hands-on and there are activities and lots of materials that people can use, and the videos is very much the basis of getting those discussions going um, in all of the sessions. So I'll show you a little couple of examples in a moment. And then at the end, people have the opportunity to kind of celebrate being part of the group um, and just sharing with, with us. Some of the groups have been sharing with us that we can put on our blog and our uh, Twitter at um, UCL to share the work that they've been doing as well. So this is a film I'm hoping all will, all will work. Um, We're not getting any sound though, are we? There's always the, the risk with videos. <laughs> um, there, there might be someone around, yeah, if you wouldn't mind, and I'll just try and find another way. All of these videos are on our website, so if, there's, if we do have any problems, then we can maybe... Oh, thank you. Do, do you capture people's journey, sort of help people, and, you know, how they're feeling? Yes. And mm. Yeah, shall I say a little bit about that, and we'll see if we can get someone to come and help with the sound, yeah. Um, so very much, you know, we've developed the programme, and we've had these groups and supported groups to run the programmes, and then the research side we've been looking at you know, is it really feasible for these groups to do this? And if they do, what are, how does it help people with um, a learning disability? What difference does it make? So we've done that in a couple of ways. We've had some questionnaires that we've wanted to ask people um, how they felt before um, about themselves and the way that they are treated, and then how they felt after, and then following them up again a couple of months later as well. Um, and also talking to them one-to-one, -one, asking about their experience of the group, asking about the actions they took and how, um, you know, how that worked out for them. So, yeah, there's a number of things we, we, we did to try and get a sense of whether it was having a positive effect. Um, and what we found, so one of the things we looked at um, that seemed to make the most difference was people's self-esteem. So actually, um, you know, their self-esteem comparing before and after doing a STORM programme that's improved, so we had some good effects there. Um, and also I think key was the sort of psychological distress, so we measured that different aspects of kind of how they felt about themselves 
um, whether they felt a bit depressed or anxious and all of these sorts of things and unwell. And again, that was something that improved over time. So some positive kind of impacts there. And also just qualitatively, the things that people told us that they felt able to speak out about, um, again, you know, seemed to be telling a positive <coughs> tale about being involved. We certainly didn't seem to come across any evidence as yet where people have kind of said, oh, do you know what, I, I, yeah, I did stand up for myself and then, you know, I got myself into trouble and this happened and it went really badly. So as yet, we've not, we've not you know, because it's very important that we monitor that, that we don't ignore that actually we're saying to people, you can speak up and you can say what you want, but then actually they have a really difficult time and can't, um, you know, uh, probably would then think that they, they shouldn't, that that message would not be reinforced. So... Um, we haven't seen any of that yet, but we're still doing the follow-up with a lot of group members, so we're still keeping an eye on that. But just whether we can get a bit of sound to show the video, if, if possible. Is there any stuff on self-awareness? So the impact of like people treating you badly, but how do you treat people? Yeah, that's not something we looked at actually. No, no. Um, are we quite interested in this far and then? Disharmony within groups, you know, the impact. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think probably oh, that should work now. Shall we just quickly test that while you're still here? This is who I am. Yes, okay, okay. perfect. I'll just pause that and finish answering your question. Yeah, um, I suppose there's a sense that we have to be fairly pragmatic with what we ask people to do, and it's quite often a problem, you know, asking people to fill out lots of questionnaires and uh, and answer questions is quite difficult. We didn't want that to be a negative experience, so we were quite limited in what we looked at, and we had quite a small pot of money and a short amount of time to do all of this. So there are limits, but we are looking at doing, you know, doing this again in the future and improving it, and I'll say a little bit about that, and some of those things would be really valid to think about looking at with more resources to, to ask some different questions of, of taking part. Thank you. So this was just a video of um, the first session. So again, just a reminder, this is where we kind of want people to talk about what it's like for them having a learning disability and what it means. So this, this is um, one of the videos just to kind of get discussion going in the group so they hear other people talking about... ...who I am and I look after myself. I can cry out about... It's not working, is it? Okay. I'm really sorry. I'm not quite sure how to get it all going, but what I will say is that I'm on the stand. So if anyone would like to come and see the video, I'm quite happy to show. It's only a very short clip, anyway. I'm quite happy to come, for you to come down, and, and I'll show you those, or I'll tell you where you can get them because we've got them all on our, our YouTube channel as well. So I'm very sorry that didn't work. Um, always a risk with <laughs> presentations, I think. Uh, I think we probably need to um, be wrapping up fairly soon. So this is just not moving on at all now, is it? I wonder if it's... Seem to have frozen it. It's really, really had enough. Okay. Any, any questions about the programme, given that I, mean, I haven't been able to show you the, the videos and so on? But... Have you written... Is, it, is there... Um, can we read up about it? Um, uh, have you... A bit of a research, a bit of yes, yeah. So um, at the moment, we're writing it up in terms of what we found out. Um, so I, I'm more than happy to let you know if you want to drop me an email. I can send you our, our report once um, once we've got that. The other thing, probably to keep an eye out on, we kind of update news about our projects on our website. Um, so it's Euclus, U-C-L-U-S. If you Google that, you should be able to find the website, and that's where the blog is, which will give you a bit more information about um, the STORM programme and what's involved, and how to kind of look at some of the videos and things that we've used as well. Um, I think that as Lisa in your other role will be putting I'm, all I'm, this on the I can do that, yeah. So um, maybe if I put um, something in the, the Community of Practice blog about the STORM programme and a way you can go and read about it, then that might be quite a nice way that people can find out um, a little bit about it. Yeah. Yeah, Sorry. so we, we, I did have some acknowledgements at the start around self-advocates that have been involved in the project all the way through. So this wasn't something... 
thinking, thinking it through and how should we do this and what, what will people want to talk about. What about these videos? Which ones do you want to use? And all of that, yeah, and even the kind of research side, looking at the measures that we use to ask people and the questions that we're going to ask. Is that, is that actually going to be just really upsetting for people in, in, in itself? And so getting their advice on that. On that note, though, so I really thank you for that question. <laughs> Going forward, what we want to be doing is thinking about um, how do we involve people with learning disabilities to co-facilitate or lead the storm groups. Something we, we'd hoped we might have been able to do as part of this small project, but actually time didn't really fully allow for that to do it justice. And um, we had to kind of make that decision. Do we do we kind of try and do it, but maybe get it a bit wrong and it's not a great experience, or do we focus on that a bit more in the future? So I'm doing from Recovery College where James is one of the peer trainers. Yes. That this is exactly the kind of thing that you know would be really good to do, and it's kind of co-to-living. I was chatting to James earlier when the, when he came in and, and said I'd really like to talk to him at lunch about how how that works and what's good about that and what's you know. How, how does it all come together? That would be brilliant because I think we could really learn from um, approaches like that. Um, and one of the things we've started doing on that journey is to both make it make it easier for anyone who's facilitating a storm group is to develop. Um, it's called a wiki. Don't ask me what that means. Someone else in the room might know a bit more about that. But we're working with the Ricks Centre at East London and they're going to develop all of these materials so it's not in this paper book and uh, a list of videos that you have to click on which people did struggle with um, that it's all on online and really accessible and neat and, and so we think that that would actually be quite a helpful way of um, you know, working alongside people with learning disabilities to deliver it that we've got a kind of technology that will help that so we're looking at developing that at the moment and trying to get some more funding that we can kind of get more uh, more groups going and as I mentioned at the start really hoping that it's kind of we're thinking of it as a public health intervention that these materials would then be freely available for any groups to use it we're not at that stage yet but that's that's our kind of vision well, I for think it. that comes from there actually that the people who want to be in a group who who have got the confidence to acknowledge it's that oppression is happening to them and they want to be able to move forward. And then some people who um, don't don't want to kind of acknowledge it publicly yes. because of the stigma. So yeah. it's almost kind of tackling it on different levels, isn't it? Absolutely. But yeah. also the strategy is to, if this happens to you, how do you then deal with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and how do you do that safely? And, and might you need to decide in different situations to deal with it? Differently. In our in our um, place, we've actually got like a it's almost like an iPod that our guys use with lots of coping skills. Oh, brilliant! Um, that they can have kind of brain in hand, so it's kind of oh, yes. you know I can see some of the these bits actually being compiled and actually putting that to that brain in hand in a coping strategy. Very much so. Yeah, that would Divine be great. Say again. I use a brain man that helps. Yeah, do you want to say a bit more? Because I don't know if anyone in, everyone in the room would know what brain in hand is. Um, would, would someone like Bas- to say? Basically, it's an iPod. An iPod. And uh, it's got, got, like, say, like, you want to get up in the morning to get up, and you depressed and that gives you a mind up. And if you've got anything important to do, it gives you a mind up, and then it gives you a lift. Then you can put, add more things in, like say, if you've got anything like, if someone winds you up and you press, press, a, press a selection option, yeah. then someone will come and see you and give you a one to one. Yeah. And then there's a red button for if, if someone, if, if Sam's worrying, you know, and is that okay, you can breathe. Yes. And okay. I find it actually is probably messing me out of the hospital sort of thing. Okay, so you've actually had a real benefit from yeah. using that. Well, I can yeah. see that brain in hand, can it, Jane? So, like, people who might press the red button to go, oh, I can't cope with this particular kind of situation, yeah. Yeah. and having some of those strategies loaded onto the app, yeah. and then looking at afterwards whether they're pressing the red button less and actually using the yeah. media and it, and it, and it is quite easy. To, and it is quite easy to get it downloaded onto your phone. There's an app yeah. that you can get. Okay. I think to have a license and that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no certainly something we can think about. Thank you for sharing that. And it would help other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. It's I can see it's self-harming, so it's helped. 
that's amazing then it, it obviously is uh, is invaluable yeah. yeah thank you for sharing that did you want to have a final word Andrew yeah yeah um, I've done some experiences myself because what you need to let that with learning switches they need to have their voices heard so what I did one time in 2012 is um, it was at Chitsa Camp Hall and everyone was moaning, everyone was going on about their cuts being sporting cutting. So uh, when all this was going on, I had a, I thought, right, I'm going to do something here because I've got to do this. And I spoke to Peter Cashfold, and so she says, and told me exactly what he's doing wrong from everyone that was going on with these people. And so, in the experiences I have is I've worked with Southdowns, with the QT, quality checker. Yeah. And what I do is I go into Southdown services and I help people to get what they want in their lives. So what's the quality for them, the services. And basically what I mean by quality is basically that, like, say like you like one thing and I may like something different. So we're kind of different, but it's the quality of the nerdicity people that need their lives. Mm. And that is what I've done in previous times. Mm. And you're the best person to kind of say yes. about that if you've got and that I, experience. Yeah, and I've worked with powerful trainers as well. I've worked with powerful trainers. And I'm like an ambassador, so I can speak up for people don't speak to. They need anyone like that to help. I can take them forward to the next level. Brilliant. That's, that's excellent. Really good. Yeah. yeah. So I think we'll end there. I'm not, I may have gone over, I'm sorry, holding people up from lunch. But um, thank you for coming along. And if you do have any questions, I'm more than happy to... I'm around all day, so let me know. <laughs>